Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. From a raw material supplier to a producer, the possibility of Africa's total transformation. Hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We know Africa has long been recognized as a significant player in the global economy, primarily as a supplier of raw materials. However, there is a growing potential for the continent to shift its focus and become a producer of finished goods. Such a transition would not only bolster the continent's economic growth, but also contribute to sustainable development. It should be noted that in November of 2015, African experts who attended the 10th African Economic Conference held in uh, Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, made a clarion call to African nations to derive ways to reduce excessive dependency on raw material export and imported consumer goods as the only viable way to reduce poverty and social inequality on the continent. In contemporary Africa, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa and of course African Union Trade Commissioner Zambian Albert Machinger have in recent times voiced that Africa would not be an exporter of raw materials, but rather a producer of finished goods. As it stands, Africa is still a heavy exporter of oils, minerals, gas, and agricultural products. However, with the paradigm shift of things in the global world, uh, now in the areas of health where we encounter the health crisis, and of course the geopolitical tension, among other aspects uh, which have actually in, uh, inculcated, actually uh, implemented uh, this uh, paradigm shift, Africa is being presented with a better opportunity to reverse the economic trends in the continent, especially with its uh, 1.3 billion people and its uh, flagship historica and historica uh, continental free trade area. So in today's program views on the continent, we will explore the possibility of Africa's transformation from a raw material supplier to a producer of finished goods. Afrique Média, le monde, c'est nous. Hello all and thanks for joining us this day. It's another edition of the program Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television Africa Media. Of course, today we want to talk economy, we want to talk the continent Africa. We want to talk a continent that is richly endowed in both natural and human resources. And of course, uh, our perspective today is to see how the continent Africa can shift uh, from uh, the exporter of uh, raw materials, of course, to a producer of finished goods of value. And that is our focus this day. It is informative as well as interactive for program. So we'll be together for one hour. And in the course of the program, we want to uh, bring forth a uh, uh, discursive uh, analysis on uh, this very important topic. What are the uh, parameters or what are the uh, necessary uh, tools to be used by stakeholders across Africa to see uh, that the continent shifts from an exporter of uh, raw materials uh, to an exporter of uh, a producer of uh, finished uh, goods of value. And that is what we are going to be analyzing with a compelling uh, a uh, panel of experts uh, joining us uh, this day. And of course, uh, with delight, I will introduce to you Mr. Elijah Enwako, who is joining from Canada and his capacity as a uh, researcher with Leeds University on African uh, Development. And thank you so much, sir, for accepting to share your perspective on this very important aspect that has to do with the development of the continent Africa, living from uh, an exporter of uh, raw materials, of course, a producer of finished goods. It's a pleasure having you this day. Good 
on Afric Media to share our perspective and ideas on how to move this wonderful continent ahead. Hopefully, we're going to have a one hour of full time together. Thanks for having me. And thank you, too, for respecting this rendezvous, Mr. Elijah Inoko. Of course, it's going to be a fruitful one hour on the Pan-African television. And, of course, uh, with delight, I introduce to you uh, Mr. Patrick Popel, a geopolitical analyst and also expert at the Center for Geopolitical Studies in Belgrade. It's a pleasure having you this day again, sir, on the Pan-African television. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm every time very happy when I can speak in this format. And I think it's very important to inform also the people in Africa about what's happened or what can be happened in the future. Thank you so much for accepting uh, the uh, rendezvous with Afric Media today. Mr. Popel and uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are just tuning in, you're most welcome to this uh, uh, very compelling TV program that uh, uh, comes to dissect uh, uh, the issues concerning the continent Africa. And of course, today our focus is on seeing how Africa can move uh, from uh, an exporter of uh, raw materials like oils, minerals, agricultural produce, and you can name the rest to uh, the a producer of finished goods that has value or have value. And of course, uh, you are most welcome. In the course of the program, you have the numbers on your screen where you can uh, participate live and share your own opinion. Remember, the goal is to see uh, that uh, there is total and practical, uh, pragmatic change across Africa in every sphere uh, with its endowment. What are the, the, the policies uh, that needs to be put in place to be able to attain this objective? Before entering uh, uh, holistically into uh, the analysis, let's listen uh, to uh, the, uh, this excerpt of uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa recently while addressing the uh, just ended Russia Africa summit. He actually reiterated and of course adding to the words of other leaders that have been critical uh, in the continent that is the president of uh, Uganda Yoweri Museveni being critical about Africa uh, stance towards changing the trend of course uh, living from an exporter to a producer let's listen to this excerpt and I will join you right after that be articulated by other leaders who have spoken before me, but more especially the very wise words of President Museveni, African countries are shaping their own destinies as nation states and as a continent. Our substantial resources must be harnessed first and foremost for Africa's benefit to grow Africa's economies and to pursue sustainable development. And as stated by others, we no longer want to be exporting all soil and dusts and rocks from the minerals of our continent, but we want to be exporting finished products that have value. There must be respect also for what we do as countries, and we must stop those countries that count their wealth and their assets in terms of the minerals that reside in the African soil, like they did in the past when they counted their wealth. They used to count their wealth in the number of slaves that they owned, that were taken from the African continent. Respect and mutual benefit should underpin what we as Africa 
And that uh, was the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, and the key word, sustainable development, growing Africa's economies, and of, of course, stopping those countries that count their wealth and assets in terms of the mineral, uh, the minerals that reside in uh, the African soil. And of course, a uh, very important uh, key uh, element, uh, key elements highlighted by uh, Cyril Ramaphosa and other uh, leaders that, that have been actually uh, intentional about seeing uh, that this, uh, there is this paradigm shift uh, as far as uh, the uh, uh, continent Africa is concerned in terms of raw material exploitation, in terms of uh, actually uh, reversing uh, the economic policies which were inherited from the time of colonialism and of course see how they can engage uh, uh, mutually with uh, uh, their uh, international partners without actually uh, uh, exporting raw materials, but seeing that Africa steps up the game by producing goods of value. Thank you again if you are just joining, you are most welcome. And we are going straight away to kick off the analysis uh, with you, Mr. Elijah Inako. Of course, uh, it is about Africa's total transformation. It's about Africa's development. And uh, with uh, the uh, uh, latest uh, economic report on Africa, it shows that this is a critical moment for African uh, countries as uh, it present uh, better opportunities for the continent Africa to actually harness its uh, economic trajectory and of course uh, bring about the sustainable development that leaders have been talking about all this while. So we want to get your perspective for Mr. Elijah in Raku regarding our topic for discussion this day, which uh, you can attest that is of great importance. Uh, yeah, Clarice, I uh, appreciate that you thought about it too, for us to discuss this very, very important topic when it comes to Africa, because <clears throat> there are three cardinal pillars <clears throat> that are driving Africa behind, and this is one of them. And we'll discuss in your show here, the issue of a monetary policy for Africa. That's number one. This one now, the issue of transformation of raw products, raw materials into finished products is the third one. And the issue, you know, that one is now politics, the, you know, independent, economic independence of Africa. But let's leave the other one and talk about what we are discussing today. The transformation of raw materials from the continent of Africa. You know, I'm a man of numbers. And when I talk, it's always good that we throw out numbers that make sense so that people understand the enormity of what we're talking about. Let's take, for example, just cocoa. That is a common cash crop that has been produced almost all of West Africa. That's just cocoa. If you look at cocoa, how much do they sell a kilogram of cocoa in West Africa? It's between 2,500 and 3,500, somewhere around there. But how much is a kilogram of chocolate from where cocoa has been produced in the international market? It's between 35,000 to 45,000 CFP. Just think for a second. The person that produces the raw materials is being paid 2,500 francs. And the person that, you know, finishes it by doing what? Crushing it, adding a few minerals here and there, packaging it and sending it back to the same country, sells a kilogram of it at 40,000 francs. That's so much unfairness in this transaction in such a way that it doesn't take rocket science to see that. Africa is being killed in this area of non-transformation of raw materials. Because when we talk, sometimes it's like, sometimes people feel like it's politics or whatnot, but it's not politics. This is reality. This is something that affects people on a daily basis. Because if you look at every area of your developmental metric that we use to measure uh, development in Africa, when it comes to the raw products, transformation of raw products, it's enormous. I have just mentioned cocoa. If you go to oil and gas, you ask yourself, how many countries in Africa that produce oil and gas actually have a refinery that transforms those products into finished products? It will surprise you. 
that Nigeria, that's an economic juggernaut in terms of production of oil and gas in Africa, <clears throat> recently just had one or two refineries working with Dangote adding another one. But that's a country that's a juggernaut when it comes to production of oil and gas in Africa. Why can't we process it? If you go to rubber, you go to any other, you can name them, iron and steel, uranium, plutonium, one by one, you will see that that is where Africa has an economic disadvantage because people come, take those products on the ground, come over here, they do a little bit of transformation, send it back to the same Africa at almost 200 to 400 to 500 thousand percent the rate at which they bought from Africa. And what that means is what? What that means is loss of jobs. Because when you have transformation happening on the soil of Africa, you're going to have people are going to get jobs. It's loss of technology because there's no transfer of technology here. Because all the technology that's being used remains in the West where the transformation takes place. There's loss of transfer of skills because all the skills that are being that are needed for the transformation of those products are not being transferred to the continent of Africa. There's an economic imbalance because we find a lot of trade imbalance between African countries and the rest of the world because these guys come and export these things, process it over there, and then they send it back to us as their own product. So it adds to their GDP, but those are not their products, even though it was gotten from Africa. They're now selling it back to the world, including Africa, their own products. That skyrocket their GDP while Africa is still wallowing. So whether you talk about job creation or trade imbalance or economy or politics or whatsoever it is, as long as we still have these products being taken from the ground, sent here to the West, processed here in the West and sent back to us, we lose. It's a lose, lose scenario. You know, Paul Kagame made a statement recently at uh, one of those meetings. He said, Africa should come to a platform where they sign an agreement and say, no product is leaving Africa without being either Finnish or semi finished Look at it this way, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world that are listening to me. What does it take, for goodness sake, to transfer or, transfer or transform uh, uh, cocoa beans into chocolate? It doesn't take much. You need to crush the cocoa beans, add a little bit of chemicals here and there, maybe a little bit whatever they do, and package it. That's what it takes. Or add milk or whatever they add to eat. We have milk in Africa. It doesn't take much to do this. It just needs the political will from our powers, our leaders that be, to put an end to this chaos. Because I call this chaos. How is it possible that you take even timber, for example, in Africa, villages are wallowing in poverty, wallowing in diseases and sickness. And these companies come to those environments or those uh, villages, exploit timber, carry it through dead parts. No single road is even tapped. That's what we're talking about. No single road is tapped. They transfer this timber, take it over here, transform it into paper, transform into toilet tissue, transform into clothing material, and then send it to back, send it back to Africa almost 3,000%. 3, this is something that shouldn't be happening. It takes just a political will. It is not because we do not have the manpower or the technological know-how. It is not because we don't have the universities and the engineers and the people to do this. It is lack of political will from the powers that be to stand up and challenge the Western powers and say, yes, we want to work with you, but you must agree to transfer the technology. You must agree to transfer the, the, the skills. You must agree for us to have a transformation here. It has been done before. It has been done before. I'll give you an example. On contemporary, a contemporary example, not in the time of Thomas Sankara, because sometimes people say, oh, that happened in the time of Thomas Sankara, that happened in recent times in Botswana, the beers, that is a company that, you know, exports gold, it transforms gold, had an agreement with the Botswana government, and they were doing crazy things over there. The current president, when he came to power, he said, guys, this has to stop. Number one, we are going to negotiate the terms of the contracts that you have with Botswana. 
DPS went, oh, no, 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 we're going to go into the World Trade Organization, we're going to do this. They stood their ground and say, you either agree to the terms of agreement or you don't exploit gold. Number two, they put an embargo on the trading of gold in the Western world. They said it must be listed in Botswana or El South Africa stock exchange market for our people to bid on it and all whatnot. Not only that, they must be, I think if I remember the terms of that agreement, close to 10% transformation of that gold on the soil of Botswana before it is taken out. They made a lot of noise and all whatnot. They were going to take them into the international uh, trade traditional court and all whatnot. But at the end of the day, the president stood his ground. And as we speak, the BAs had to sign into that contract. And that's what they're doing. So it is doable. It just needs the political will for the leaders in Africa to put an end to this craziness and it will be done. So there are many things we're going to be talking about. I'll give opportunity to my colleague as well. Uh, this uh, topic is a uh, concern. Uh, we are uh, coming to you, Mr. Patrick Popel, in the same perspective. Uh, you're one person who has been very critical about uh, the uh, uh, African continent's uh, total transformation and, of course, living uh, from a supplier of uh, raw materials. Let me put it in, in uh, maybe uh, sending raw materials out there very cheap uh, to a producer of uh, finished goods. And, of course, uh, I will appreciate your total or holistic perspective on this uh, topic before we enter into some uh, particularities. So first I like, first I like to say that uh, what our colleague said, uh, I totally agree about this, but I don't like to talk about this economical um, situation. So my expertise and also my research is first about security policy and, and uh, geopolitical um, um, yes summaries so the problem is when Africa try to be not only the exporter of this of this raw material and like to be uh, like the industrial states so it will be a target for Western interests we can see now what's happened in Ukraine. We can see what's happened in Ukraine now. We can see we have this war from the West against Russia because Russia is a is a, 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 a country with, with raw materials. This is the problem, and they like to get it. And when Africa go out of this old policy to a new to a new policy to to um, make new contracts to uh, develop their countries into like the West in this in this um, uh, industrial uh, complexes. So it will be a target for uh, for the Western interests. And the, the main problem I see when I can when I can um, research about what's happening in Africa. Only, only on the paper. I wasn't every time there, but I can see that there is no um, big structure from continental structure in Africa. So every uh, country are together with the others when there is some problem, security problem, or something else. Now we can see what's happened in uh, Niger after after what's changed now. Yes. So we can see we need an I can say it and like an African spirit. We need uh, the people in Africa from the different ethnics, different religions, different states. They must think together. Before this happens, it's not possible to change in a, in a new political way because then the different countries, when they like to change in this, uh, there will be targets for Western interests because the West needs the resources of Africa. This is the, 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 the fundament of the wealthy of the West. The fundament of, of, of what's happened in the West, the development, was only to get the, the cheap resources from other continents. 
and then Africa decide to make it to finish this. So then we are on a, on a, on on the step to the a big war. And so before Africa can decide this, Africa must create a structure, a architecture of security to uh, be ready also for problems with the West and to uh, keep and to protect their interests. Before, it's like a suicide commando. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Patrick. Of course, uh, uh, a lot has to be tackled in order to ensure uh, this uh, uh, narrative shift as far as the African continent is uh, uh, concerned, uh, and of course, how uh, its uh, economic trajectory can go smoothly without being impeded by either uh, some uh, uh, policies uh, uh, that are actually uh, uh, in place uh, at this particular moment. Uh, uh, let me continue the, uh, uh, the debates with you, Mr. Elijah Inoroku. Uh, we're talking about Africa uh, living from an exporter of raw materials to a producer, and we're looking at the possibility of these in uh, ensuring Africa's total uh, transformations. Uh, so the, the the question now, because when I when I listened uh, critically to to, to you, the analysis, the holistic analysis uh, presented by yourself and uh, Mr. Patrick on this topic on discussion, we begin to want to understand uh, what actually the problem is, and now we want to look at how. Africans or African countries can reverse the economic trends uh, which have been existing or economic models which they actually inherited from the former uh, colonial masters which are still standing as impediment to the continent's uh, total economic transformation in present day society. You know, when when you in, inherit something and you're still actually uh, very much into it, it's, uh, it actually limits your perspective and how far you can go to, to make changes. So with all of this now being conversant uh, with uh, the fact that, of course, the economic policies existing in the days of colonialism and uh, which are still actually thought by some countries in Africa today uh, a hindrance to uh, continents, uh, political leaders and other economic stakeholders taking uh, some key economic decisions across the African continent that can push for this transformation. So in your perspective and a keen pundit uh, uh, as far as uh, Africa's uh, development is concerned, what are those policies that we can actually take in today's world, which, were, which will be very uh, uh, practical in bringing about economic buoyancy in Africa that will replace uh, uh, the uh, economic models existing in the days of the colonial masters, which we still see uh, some in today's world? Yes, yes, Clarice, what you've said is true, but I want to say that that is, where, that is not where the problem is. The problem is in lack of leadership that can take the bull by the horns. I'll give an example down south here. We have a guy here, even though many people don't like him, called Donald Trump. He's not a friend of mine, but he did something which, you know, you can say, this needs, this is somebody that had the courage to do what is needed. When he came to power, he looked at NAFTA. NAFTA is North American Free Trade Agreement. And he thought, the United States, which is a super juggernaut between, you know, when you compare to Canada, where I live, and Mexico, that's down south, it's a free trade agreement between these three countries. He said the United States was being cheated. We are like, you know, in terms of economic um, power and GDP and everything, they were like almost two thirds of the whole uh, NAFTA zone. So he said, that has to be renegotiated. That was not possible. It wasn't fair to the United States. Canada made noise. And, uh, Mexico made noise. No, these are trade agreements. You can't do the, can't do that. We have to go to WTO, World Trade Organization, to litigate this and all this. He stood his ground. 
And when he stood his ground, what happened? He calls Canada is very dependent. You know, Canada is almost like the United States. I don't see any reason why they're even two different countries because the borders are you know, walking back and forth in between the two. And the economies are interwoven. What happens down here is the same thing that happens here. It's the same economy and the same people. But because of that, the same thing with Mexico, they have to come to the table and say, look, we know that this guy is a bully. We know that this guy is this. But at the end of the day, they had to agree to a renegotiation of the terms of NAFTA. And he got what he wanted because he holds the knife and holds the yarn. That is what Africa needs to do. It doesn't matter that Cameroon, Niger, or all these French countries sign a so nonsense agreement with France and say that France has to be done to exploit the resources of this country. And if France is not able to exploit the resources of this country, that's when a third country can come in. Those countries can call that BS and say, we need to negotiate this again. This was negotiated in the time of colonization. We are no more colonized. We, we are independent. We want to renegotiate in terms of this agreement. Like I gave you an example, that's what the president of Botswana did. His predecessor had got all these deals with all these companies. And when he came to power, he saw that they were unfair to the country. The country holds the knife on the young because that's where the resources are coming from. You're not going to be begging for the person who is supposed to come and exploit from you. You are the one that holds the upper hand. You dictate the terms of that agreement. That is what African countries are supposed to do. They are supposed to stand their grounds. Like my colleague said, one of the problems you find in Africa is this divide and rule. Africa is not united. If we have an African platform that takes care of all these trade agreements and say, look at the terms of agreement that Nairobi, Burkina Faso, or whosoever is going into, these terms of agreement do not favor Africa, do not favor this country. And these need to be renegotiated. If Cameroon is doing the same thing. Nigeria is doing the same thing. Burkina Faso is doing the same thing. Niger with its uranium with France stands its ground. All the African countries stand its ground. There's no Western power, even this state that will come down. We're going to wipe out the whole Africa because they're not agreeing with the terms of agreement because they see unity in purpose. They will come to the table and negotiate. The problem is that we don't have courageous leaders in Africa in the likes of Paul Kagame, Yuri Yusuveni, William Roto, Ramaphosa, and others Malema in South Africa. We don't have leaders that can you know, come together and create a platform to turn Western hegemony on the resources of Africa. That's where the problem is. If we have leaders like that, I'm telling you, it is doable. How is it possible that a landlocked country like Rwanda that does not have resources like the rest of the country is able to innovate and come to a point where Western powers are now referencing Rwanda as an economic model to be emulated by other countries. How is it possible? You need a leader with that foresight, a leader that can stand up and say, this is what we are doing and this is what we are going to do. Because some of these leaders, Clarice, let me tell you some of these leaders, I don't know how they think. Because if you look only at the increased revenue, because Africa is cash trapped. They're going to the uh, Britain Wood Institution Borman. Africa is cash trap. But within their nose, they have the means to come out from these economic doldrums. If you look at the value addition that transformation of raw material is going to add to the revenue of African economies, oh my goodness, why can't they take advantage of this opportunity? Because commodity prices fluctuate when it comes to cash craft commodity. But the price of you know, finished product does not fluctuate that much in terms of commodity prices. So you're dealing with gold, you're dealing with raw gold, you're dealing with iron ore, you're dealing with this. Look at the prices in the world market. They are zigzag up and down. But look at the prices of, i just give an example. I gave an example a while ago. Look at the price of chocolate in the world market. You don't find it going up and down. So the economies of these countries are going to be stable when they start dealing with semi-finished products instead of raw materials where you have that fluctuation in the economy. Not only that, look at transfer technology. Let's just say here that we stand, you know, look at the case of Niger, for example. Niger is in war now and France is threatening to, to, to attack because of what they're getting in terms of uranium. If Niger had the technological know-how 
to even transform that uranium into intermediate, I'm not talking about finished product, into an intermediate product. They have the leeway to get rid of France, get rid of any other country, and sell that product to any other country that is ready to buy finished finish product in the world. So whether you look at it from an economic angle, you look at it from a technological angle, you look at it from a revenue generation angle, or you look at it from just diversification of the economy, an economy that's not dependent on raw materials, these, transporting these, economy that has both the technological know-how, the raw materials, the knowledge that it needs in order to avoid the shocks in the world. We just went through COVID. African countries were begging for food to eat. Can you imagine? Begging for food to eat. Because the economy is so dependent on these raw materials, we do not have the technological know how to have semi finished product that can withstand the shocks in the economy. That is where we are today. So, to answer your question, African leaders need to stand their ground and cancel even all those colonial, whatever it is, and say, we went into agreement with France, we went into agreement with this. Those were colonial era. We are no more in the colonial era to say it must be this country that must exploit our products. No, we can renegotiate the terms of those agreements and start afresh. In data, Mr. Elijah Inoroku, I will come back to you subsequently uh, for us to develop further that uh, aspect which we, you just highlighted, uh, the aspect of uh, uh, maybe uh, poor leadership across Africa, the fact that Africa is still not united. Uh, we are going to analyze that uh, better. But let's continue with Mr. Uh, Patrick, uh, taking it from the geopolitical perspective for uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Popel. It is imperative uh, that, uh, and it is also good that African leaders or stakeholders, be it political and even economic stakeholders across Africa have become conversant uh, with the fact uh, that uh, uh, there is, it is time for Africa uh, to be intentional or leaders to be intentional about what they want for uh, the continent. And we are focusing on uh, this very aspect of the raw material, which presents uh, a better opportunity for Africa. And uh, with the changing trends, we also uh, see that the scope is actually very broad for Africa uh, to take advantage of and uh, uh, fasten uh, this uh, its uh, strong policies, especially uh, foreign policies uh, that will help the continent attain uh, this level uh, from uh, uh, taking it from of a dependency, uh, especially on a commodity uh, products. So what uh, the question I would like you to respond to Mr. Patrick is how we can uh, actually see how African governments and international organizations can work together to facilitate uh, the uh, necessary infrastructure and investment for Africa to become a producer. You know, we are in a globalized world and we are uh, in, a, in a world that has seen uh, much interconnectivity. So now how can uh, African government and uh, maybe the organizations, can we talk about BRICS? Can we talk about even individual nations that are engaging more with Africa? How can they actually uh, uh, correlate in a way that it will help Africa to attain uh, uh, this milestone of being a producer of valuable goods? It's, it's very good that you talk about BRICS because uh, BRICS is now the geopolitical game changer. Um, we have now the, the situation that uh, uh, the continents are working together. So uh, years before, um, the problems of continents was on the inside of this continent. But now we are in this globalist world. But this um, globalist world has also this little essence of multipolarity now and so um we can see it's growing up and so with this BRICS uh alliance we have uh, a very interesting um situation so we have the situation that uh, 
China can invest in Africa, or maybe uh, they're talking about also the monetary system. So everything is changing. But um, I like to say important is what also my colleague said uh, about the situation inside the African countries. We have that many corruption and many of these people on the top of the countries are not more than the dogs of the West, the, the hounds of the West. So uh, we have this uh, colonialism now also, not political, but in, uh, but in, uh, in economic questions. We have this uh, a system like 150 years before, or many, many of the countries has this history since the last century. So I think the problem is we need strong leaders. Yes, it's important. We need this international connection. And here is BRICS, I said, the game changer. Mm -hmm. And we need also a close contact to the uh, civil society and to the businessmen, to the, uh, also to the Western businessmen. Mm -hmm. And they can also help. I have many experience about people's diplomacy when I'm working also for the interests of Russia or from other states to, to connecting the people, to connecting the different groups and organizations. And I think it is very important for Africa, for the different countries, but also for the whole Africa. There must be a network, there must be created a network for this people diplomacy. It's very important to get investments from the West or to get also technology, to get different uh, support or joint ventures to organize it. Very important. So I think uh, I'm living in Vienna and uh, we have in Vienna, we have the embassy for, from every African state because Vienna is an international city. We have the UN, the OECD, we have many different uh, organizations, international organizations. So we have an embassy from every African state, but they are not well connected in the Austrian society. They, all, they only have meetings in the UN or different uh, bilateral uh, meetings with other states, but not with, with the community here. Mm -hmm. I think there are many different companies they like to make something in Africa, and Africa needs the support. Yes, they have good university, they have the resource, they have this maybe leaders they're not very strong but we can see what the president of southern africa said in the conference it was a very good speech so we can see it's very different africa is very different we have different countries they're very on the corruption and under the under the fingers of the west so like the marionettes so but like the puppets of the west but we have also uh States like Niger, Burkina Faso, and so on, and also uh, South Africa. So um, we have a very different situation in every state there, but they must think on one topic together. This is the independence, the sovereignty, and to create this new system or this new aspect, to see this new aspect, to go from a seller of your materials to a producer. This is very important. And I like to say about my special topic, security. Um, yes, in, uh, in the Arabic countries um, and in this um, Arabic Spring, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq, Iraq, we can see what's happened there, Syria. Yeah? So, and I said on the beginning about the necessary of um, an structure of security for the African continent because the global players are very strong and there are many little, very small countries in Africa and they need to make also a defense alliance or something else. Without this, you couldn't go these next steps. So the need, only one, one little um, um, explanation about this. You need, if you have good resources, many resources, you need a very good air defense. Without a good air defense, you couldn't go to the West, maybe to the USA and say, no, 
we have no new ideas about our economy. So we, we will be bombed. It's the reality. So we need different structures for Africa, the structure for people's diplomacy to make new contacts to companies, to, to different other countries, but also to organizations. Um, and Africa needs, let's say, it, air uh, defense, but also other uh, areas of security must be uh, grow up because you need this security when you are here on this international level. And Africa is very important. The resources of Africa are very important for the Western economies. And they, uh, they don't choke. It's important to know. Let me stay with you, Mr. Patrick, of course, talking about the resources of Africa, uh, which are very important uh, to Western economies. So uh, some pundits actually uh, as, uh, of the viewpoint of that if uh, and uh, of course, uh, before actually highlighting the viewpoint of this uh, pundit, let's even capitalize on uh, a statement which uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, said in his excerpt, which we listened uh, uh, earlier on about the fact that the era, we should move from that era where some people or some countries will count most of their wealth and assets uh, just on the availability of raw materials that they get from the African soil. And of course, we want to look at how uh, if uh, we can change uh, the uh, uh, Western hegemony, because when you look at it critically, and uh, the amount of raw materials that leave Africa uh, to Western countries, uh, it still brings us back to how we can uh, maybe conquer the Western hegemony, especially in their financial aspect as well, to be able to give uh, the African continent or African leaders uh, 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 upper hand and upper hand in uh, the negotiation of especially economic, uh, economic uh, terms or economic uh, projects uh, between Africa and other countries. Uh, I remember one uh, analyst who highlighted uh, it was on African Media TV uh, that so long as Africa doesn't have the economic priorities, it will be difficult for Africa uh, or Africa's voice to be heard, especially at the international level. Given that Africa has everything that it, it takes for a nation or a continent to evolve economically, what do you think from a geopolitical perspective, uh, what do you think uh, African uh, can do, especially in terms of their foreign policies, not only with African countries, but especially with countries uh, uh, across the globe? <sighs> I think all of this depends only about the questions of unity. Unity. Africa needs this unity. Uh, and I see the problems now also um, about all the languages. You have, have friends from Africa, I couldn't uh, speak with them in English. We must use Russian language because they've studied in Russia and <laughs> because they're only speaking French when they are from Congo. So we haven't um, the problems of the different ethnics and the, the languages and the different cultures in Africa. And so it's a very, very difficult situation to uh, go on this stage of the global world as one block. It's not, it's not possible now for Africa. And so I couldn't answer you uh, on your question because I think um, we have different aspects, um, but the first aspect I like to say it's the security and the network. The security for Africa, the African countries, the sovereignty, and also an international network of people. They are working really in their heart for their countries. So diplomats, also businessmen, but when they are patriots and when they are for their people, they can make great things for the people in their, uh, in their countries, I think. So Africa needs this spirit that the people on the top, or in the level before the top, so the same with top level, they must be patriots, they must be people working for the interests of the countries. 
And this not happens now because many of them only buy by the West, working for the Western interests, and so on. This is the first thing that must, must be realized. To, to have this spirit for Africa, to the people working for the people of Africa, not for the interests of other countries. This is very important. Yes? Uh, this is the first step. And what's developing after this? Now I couldn't uh, <laughs> say because I'm I'm uh, very realistic about the problems and I don't like to make prognoses about the future because everything depends on different topics. First, the security. Second, the network, the international network. Third, I think uh, to grow up societies in Africa that the people work for the interests of the people of, from Africa. It's important. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Patrick. Just a reminder, those of us just tuning in, uh, that you're on Africa Media and you're watching Views on the Continent. And our focus today is to see and uh, analyze how African countries can uh, lift uh, from a shift from uh, uh, being a supplier of raw materials to a producer of semi-finished or finished goods of value. And we are looking at the possibility of the, the factors that will actually encourage Africa's total transformation and factors of that are impediment and how these uh, solutions or these uh, factors which are uh, impediments can be uh, reversed and of course uh, see uh, that uh, uh, the stakeholders uh, maybe the role of uh, uh, political leaders uh, civil society and of course the business uh, class uh, in Africa and particularly the private sector that can actually engage in seeing uh, that uh, uh, stakeholders are intentional about uh, attaining this uh, perspective. Uh, we continue in the same perspective with you, Mr. Elijah Enrico. Earlier on, you highlighted the aspect of leadership, which of course uh, is uh, very important, you know, when the leadership is not actually meeting uh, the aspirations of the people and the leadership is not a visionary uh, we see of uh, how it is affecting even the growth of a country a growth of a continent and that's where uh, we are so now uh, i want us to analyze further into this uh, because we want to look at the 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 uh, hindrances or the obstacles of, of these uh, africa's uh, maybe economic integration now let's look at the fragmented uh, nature of the African continent and uh, see if uh, this is a great, great hindrance to Africa's standing in one voice, especially at the international level. And if yes, what can be done? Now we are looking for solutions. What practicalities can come into place? Or, or maybe what is the, the uh, uh, modus operandi that uh, these stakeholders need to adopt today to reverse these economic trends and to see that indeed, in terms of international cooperation, there is uh, uh, actually uh, African countries and the other countries are at the same level of negotiations and uh, at presenting points which can go ahead to prosper both nations and not only seeing uh, that countries are engaging more in having raw materials taken from Africa to be transformed elsewhere. And we know the effect on that, especially on the employment of uh, young people across Africa. Mr. Elijah Inako. Is there something going on? Paris, can you hear me? I can hear you now, sir. You can write on. Okay, good, good. Mm -hmm. I was saying that, uh, you know, we are from Africa, you know. In Africa, we know that when you are going into a fight, when we we're kids, when we we're growing up, and somebody won't come and fight you, you always try in a way that you take the fight closer to your home because you know your brother is there, your sister is there, your uncle, your friends, then well, if you come tough, they are going to join you and fight the enemy. You fight on your turf. You fight where your strength is. 
Africa has a strength, and that strength is that God has blessed us with these natural resources. That's where our strength is. You fight based on what your strength is. You are going to a negotiation table, you already have the knife and the yarn. You have to dictate the terms of the arrangement. You talked about the influence of the West on manipulating Africa. But let me tell you something. Africa, it's if your house is not divided, nobody's going to come to your house. If your husband and wife are not divided, no intruder is going to come in to destroy that family. The problem in Africa is that we have leaders that are being used by the West to destroy any unitary platform that Africa wants to come up with. Let's take, for example, a course that is right now trying to double with Niger. When the economic community of West African states came out with a single currency, which they called ECO, they adopted a plan and they adopted a strategy and they came out with a preamble and everybody signed into it. How did it fall apart? On the last minute, Ivory Coast, Ivory Coast stood against that plan and brought in what the so-called ECO, whatever it is, and tried to pack it into the euro. And that was a manipulation that was done by France, passing to Ivory Coast, to try that strategy. As we speak today, it's almost dead. Nobody's hearing about that plan of ECOWAS to have a single monetary policy. That is what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Africa does not have the leadership that can stand up to this. They have puppet leaders. If you look at it, another case, Clarice, look at the opportunity that, you know, you asked my colleague from the plan, how Africa, you know, take advantage of geopolitical maneuvering that's happening. Look at what's happening and opportunity that's presenting in South Africa. Mm -hmm. In terms of diversification of partnership, instead of actively engaging in some sort of South-South cooperation, what's happening? They are being tossed by the European Union. They are being tossed by, you know, North American partners. They are being tossed here and there, and they are fragmented. French countries, some of them are trying to align themselves with France, while others are trying to align themselves with BRICS, others are trying to align themselves with the United States and Canada. Other... So there is this misalignment. African countries don't have an aligned policy and a platform in which they can work. Therefore, Western powers take opportunity about that fragmentation and they divide the policy, they use the policy of divide and rule. Because if you diversify your diplomatic and economic ties, what that does is that it avoids over dependence on a single partner and then it maximizes the negotiating power. That's what you do. You say, okay, I have this partner, I have this partner. If EU is not coming to the table in terms of my requirements and my needs and what I put on the platform, I can go with maybe some other South-South cooperation, maybe the BRICS, maybe India, maybe uh, China, maybe Brazil, maybe this one. But they are so fragmented in such a way that they do not have that complex. Not only that, I talk about your strength. You have to leverage on your strength. The strength of Africa, as we know it, nobody is going to deny that fact. Mm -hmm. It's our natural resources. In terms That's of technology, yeah. we are still coming there. But you have to strategize and say, this is my strength. You're not going to play the ball. You're not going to play the game on my turf because this is my turf. I have to dictate the terms of the argument. I have to dictate the destination of investment. I have to dictate the positioning and become a burgeoning market. Africans attract foreign direct investment. We do not need to necessarily go to the World Bank. We do not necessarily need to do the Britain World Institution. We do not need, we can negotiate bilateral agreement with a lot of countries without going through this draconian uh, policy that has been put in place by the World Bank and the uh, in, uh, financial uh, uh, Britain World Institutions and imposing terms on Africa that are giving them aids that come with strings attached. We do not need to go through that. You can negotiate with Patterns and say, okay, I'll give you an example. There's what we call an infrastructure development deal. The infrastructure development deal states that for any Western power that's come to Africa to extract gold, rubber, whatever it is, the terms agreement says that the economy 
of that region. It could be, let's take, for example, you're in Cameroon and you're producing, you know, gold or whatever it is from the Littoral Province or Southwest Province. The economy of that region must be commensurate to the economy of the country or the municipality where this product is going to be semi-finished. Let's say this product is going to be finished in Brussels. You say the, the infrastructure agreement it says that. The infrastructure in that zone where the product is being produced must be comparable. It doesn't say it must be exact. It must be comparable. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that you are not going to be producing, for example, timber, and the roads in all that region are all dusty, dead path, and you're going to be, you know, finishing that product in Brussels, where you have all these gigantic roads and infrastructure and everything. No, the economy of those communities where this product is being exploited must be comparable, commensurate with the economy of the municipality where it is going to be semi finished. That is an infrastructure agreement. African president can take advantage of things like this and go into this kind of agreement. Cultural diplomacy. For some of you are in Kumba. I know I come from Kumba. That's where I come from. I grew up there. There was a mayor there that was called Mayor. Uh, 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 what was his name? Oh, I, he passed away. No Kumbele. That was his name. He went to the Netherlands and had an infrastructure agreement with the community in the Netherlands. Can't remember which community is that. Yeah. And that is how Kumba was started. Kumba was based on a bilateral municipal agreement between a community in the Netherlands and the Kumba Regional Council. That was the first time I grew up in that place. And that was the first time I saw Kumba being tired, having grown up there. That was the first time. But again, African leaders are not taking advantage of this. Recently, we just talked about the climate uh, agreement that Africa was trying to negotiate. Look at the mess that happened there. What did the African countries get from that climate leadership conference? What did they get from it? There was a discussion and an agreement that they were going to, this number of loans were going to be involved or uh, dispersed to the African country. Which country can, has actually stood and said, we got this from the climate agreement that, you know, was agreed upon that African countries are not polluters, therefore they need to be compensated for that. Which country in Africa can stand and say, this is what we got from that agreement. This is what we are implemented. These are the resources. This is the uh, development that's come. No, you don't see that. That's what I'm saying. African countries do not have strategic diplomacy, like my colleague already mentioned. You only find them hovering around in the you know, African UK summit, Africa Russia summit, Africa China summit, Africa. Before we know it, we will start having Africa India summit. It is a colossal disgrace for the African continent to be having this without any strategy strategic arrangement for the development of the continent, given the fact that we hold the night and the year. The resource all over the whether you're talking about gold, you're talking about silver, you're talking about plutonium, you're talking about uranium, you can name them and I will tell you where Africa stands in terms of those resources. So again, we need the right leadership in order to compete in the rest of the world because we already have the knife and the year. Indeed, uh, it's about an intentional leadership. It's about a leadership uh, that is visionary and, uh, of course, uh, very determined to take Africa to the top. You, you know, uh, uh, there's the Africa's Agenda 2030, Africa's Agenda 2063, and of course, how are we going to attend this? We need a strong political will, of course. We need also the role of the civil society and uh, the private sector in uh, uh, doing that. Uh, uh, we continue briefly with you. Uh, Mr. Patrick Popel, we are looking at ways on how Africa can become a producer of goods, which is imperative in uh, present day uh, society. And Mr. Elijah Enoko has underlined the importance of multilateralism in seeing Africa uh, become uh, a game changer in every sphere, especially in the sphere of uh, economic. But then now we know that when when it, uh, a period comes like this, uh, there are usually some, uh, uh, let me say, shocks or uh, that can actually be felt by Africans themselves trying to move from one era uh, to the other. So the question 
which I will direct to you, uh, Mr. Patrick, is uh, uh, on this aspect of like what potential economic and social benefits can be expected if Africa uh, successfully transitions into a producer from a raw material to actually a raw material uh, uh, supplier. And another question uh, is how can Africa's international partners uh, that are actually technologically savvy, we know that we are already in the fourth industrial revolution and there is need for Africa uh, to gain, uh, there is need for this exchange of expertise to see uh, that it becomes a reality to see a production in Africa. There is need to boost the production uh, capacity of African countries. So in your perspective, what can be done and how, uh, what are the social and uh, maybe economic and social benefits of this transition? Yeah. First, first you must understand that the, uh, the, the, the wealthy uh, of a society comes from their business in every society. So when Africa goes a step from this um, uh, only um, raw material states to this industrial states, so the big benefit for everybody in the country, the first. Also about all situations in Africa, about reality, about the ethnic conflicts and something else. Also the ethnic conflicts are uh, the result of the of the uh, economical problems first. So this is the starter for every ethnic conflict. You can see it in history. So then you have this uh, um, uh, next step of economical development. You have more security inside. You have uh, less problems, uh, and you have a better social life. This is the first thing everybody can understand it. And uh, about the development um, to grow up the industry, to grow up the business. So I think it needs only idea and very, very strong politicians. So, and also investments, yes, but I'm not an economist. Uh, I think important is the security situation, important is the idea of the people in Africa and the will to, to, to make something. This is very important to have this aspect. Um, sorry, but I must leave this show because I have the next meeting. Nice. But um, I hope that my expertise was interesting for the people of Africa. And uh, I'm every time very glad when I can participate on your show. But now I must leave because I have a meeting. And uh, But also in this meeting, we are talking about Africa. And so uh, I'm very happy to take part on your show. And okay. uh, I hope that uh, we have more and more ideas to give perspectives for Africa. This is very important to me. Of course, uh, we are almost uh, rounding off for uh, Mr. Patrick, and I want to uh, appreciate your insight uh, on a topic for discussion uh, this day. Thank you for respecting this uh, rendezvous. And of course, let's uh, come back to you, Mr. Elijah uh, Enoko. We are looking at uh, the uh, existing institutions in Africa and how these uh, institutions, we cannot uh, actually undermine the African Union, but then uh, there have been so many controversies surrounding uh, the existence of the African Union. And you know, today we are talking about uh, the uh, Africa moving from uh, a supplier of raw material to a producer and looking at the feasibility of Africa's uh, transformation. And in your analysis, you actually pinpointed the, the, the major problems faced by the continent Africa. Let's analyze this last aspect before we go, the aspect of uh, diplomacy and of course the role of the African Union in trying to take Africa to the top and to, to boost its uh, production uh, capacity. You underlined earlier on Africa has 
what it takes. That is the raw material. And not just the raw materials, Africa has the market. You remember we, in the preamble, we highlighted uh, the available market of about 1.3 uh, uh, billion. And of course, uh, uh, looking at also uh, the manpower or the level. So in your perspective, what is the role of the African Union, uh, Africa's uh, diplomacy, and, and how can this actually boil uh, towards uh, attaining an objective of boosting the Africa's production capacity? Very is good that you ask that question. <clears throat> because if you look at the regional integration in Africa, it's a big problem. Because if the regional powers are not even integrated by, by themselves, then you don't expect the African Union to be even integrated. Because the regional powers are all a mess. Look at what is happening with ECOWAS as we speak. Instead of ECOWAS trying to negotiate a peace agreement with Niger, they are actually trying to go to war. That tells you that regional powers are not actually serving the interests of the people. Because if you talk about transformation of raw raw materials into semi-finished products. For example, you're talking about things like the Af African continental free trade area that we've talked about in your show. You're talking about creating a unified and harmonizing regulation because if you leave from one African country to the other, the terms on which Niger is trading on uranium with France, you will find it in the next African country that's trading on the same uranium with the United States completely different. There's no unified regulation on what needs to be done in Africa. Because Africa can become a really attractive investment destination if we gain a stronger negotiation position in the international community. We don't have that. We don't have that. The free trade is an area that is going to give some impetus into that. But we don't we are not yet there. We have you and I have talked about that in this show for a very long time. But that's the path. We need to have strong institution and strong framework that is going to be like a standard for the Western world and the other organizations to deal with Africa and say, you know, I mentioned Paul Kagame because he made a statement. It might sound like a slogan as, as of now, mm -hmm. but it's a statement that if it's implemented all across Africa, Clarice, and the rest of the people that are listening to me, if that is implemented across Africa, if if every African country can sign on that agreement that he made. But that statement, he said at the conference, I think it was in Dubai, or I can't remember where he made that statement, he said, African country should sign and undertake that no raw materials leave Africa without at least being semi-finished. That every African country should have taken that. Every, every negotiation, every agreement, every bilateral agreement, every international agreement that they're going into, with other international organizations. They should sign on undertaking that. No raw material leaves the soil of Africa as raw material. It must be either finished or semi-finished. Mm -hmm. What does it want to? If they take undertaking and sign on a platform or unity platform, and every other country that is coming to the continent of Africa to do business with any country in Africa knows that those are for which they are going to be signing any agreement. I'm telling you, they will, they, will, they, will, they will sit up. They will sit up. They will sit up. Look at, like we mentioned before, about the strength of Africa. We have, from these other raw materials that we've talked about, like gold, coffee, coke, water. Africa also has natural resources like heat, energy. But in Africa, you will be shot of you know, I read a research paper recently, how days, how many hours, how many days of the year that African countries are in the dark because of electricity. But why can't we have power? When we have all the resources and the dust that can generate electricity that can be so hard to yield in Africa, we have the resources. Why not focusing on that? You focus on your strength and then you work on your weaknesses. Absolutely. That is the challenge that we're having in Africa. So these regional blocks do not have a strategy. I don't want to go into the issue of uh, the African Union being sponsored 63% of their resources coming from the Western world. They can get rid of that if they have the, you know, they put their house in order because we know that the European Union you know, sponsors the budget of the African Union is 63% uh, sponsored by the European Union. Mm -hmm. What about 30 something or 20 something comes from the African Union? 
But again, these things, sometimes, you know, we do talk against it, but sometimes you look at their budget. The budget is close to zero. That's why they have to depend on Western powers to sponsor the African Union. But it doesn't need to come to that. If these guys can put their house in order, have regional policies that takes into consideration their strength, feel okay. on their strength. If you are producing rubber, if you're a country that's producing rubber, you build on that strength. Have strong negotiation uh, agreement with the, those partners. If you are the country that has uranium, like Niger and these other countries, you have a platform. If you are a country that's producing gold, you have a platform. How is it possible? How is it possible that a country like France, even the UK, that does not have any gold mine anywhere, they are almost the sixth and the seventh in terms of foreign gold reserves in their bank. And that's what's propping up their currency. But African countries, they are here, their own currency is pegged to France. Not only is it not pegged to France, their own, oh my goodness, it's a mess all over Africa. We need to put our house in order. As long as the house is in disorder, we are not going to get there. That's the problem. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah Enorko. And co of course, there is need uh, to put order in a house. Uh, charity begins at uh, home, and of course, with all uh, the uh, perspectives uh, from various uh, uh, panel of experts, uh, and of, of course, uh, the fact that uh, the media in Africa has been intentional about uh, broadcasting uh, constructive programs or bringing forth constructive uh, debate programs uh, uh, that can change uh, the narratives across Africa, uh, change the African mindset, and redefine uh, uh, perspectives uh, in uh, political, social, and economic perspectives in a bid to see that uh, the continent Africa stands uh, and occupies its position and also to have have a strong voice when it comes to international negotiations. Uh, uh, leaders, uh, of course, should be intentional about ensuring uh, the uh, total integration, especially economic integration of Africa, and of course, uh, go with the philosophies of the fathers of Pan-Africanism who preach that together as a continent, together as one, Africa can be able uh, to stand firm as a strong economic priority. And I think the African continental free trade area is a good example of such a, a tool that African uh, leaders of today can capitalize on to be able uh, to take Africa to the top. I want to thank you so much, Mr. Elijah Inoko and uh, Mr. Patrick Fell for the uh, great analysis uh, on our topic for discussion this day. And of course, uh, for those who participated by leaving their uh, messages on our Facebook page, I want to thank you for your insight. And of course, I acknowledge uh, the uh, technical crew for ensuring that the program was a success. Uh, thank you for trusting the Pan-African Television. Uh, we've come to the end of the program, Views on the Continent, for this day. But don't go away. Keep having a lovely moment as you get informed still on African Media TV. See you some other time. Thank <music> you.